when I started taking an interest in film, uh, there was, it was a bit like eating your greens up, uh, an ancillary thing about documentaries and that you couldn't really take uh, an acceptable interest in film without having at least a knowledge of documentaries. Uh, that's slightly cynical uh, and some of them were worthy and informative but not terribly exciting. But in amongst that group there were some really marvellous films and two of those are the ones that we're going to consider now. Let's just go back right to the very beginning uh, when the Lumiere brothers uh, made their train entering a station and the workers leaving the factory. These were of course documentaries. So documentary does go back to the very beginnings of cinema. And uh, I, I don't think very much notice was taken until uh, Robert Flaherty came up with Nanook of the North in the 1920s. Uh, and suddenly uh, here was a documentary which drew people into the cinema. I don't think any of Flaherty's other films actually made anything like as much money as Nanook, but uh, it, it was uh, an important milestone in the recognition of documentary filmmakers. Uh, but of course also uh, when the Russian Revolution happened in 1917, uh, Lenin was very keen that the uh, film should be used to propagandize the new way of life and that a number of uh, uh, very excellent filmmakers uh, produced work uh, of uh, either semi if not completely documentary nature about uh, the benefits for the Russian people and s stepping on the same bandwagon of course the, uh, the Nazis when they came to power in Germany were very keen to harness the power of the cinema and particularly the 1936 Olympics uh, was uh, filmed under the uh, control of Leni Riefenstahl uh, and, and I've never actually seen it but I am told that it is an amazingly uh, powerful film um, and also of course propaganda uh, and the, 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 the Nazi style rallies and uh, mass formations and so forth were obviously very photogenic. In Britain uh, I, I, there was less uh, immediate government interest but they couldn't be unaware of what was going on and many government organisations uh, such as uh, the post office, did have their own film units. Uh, so too did the, the Commonwealth and uh, other things that could use it for explaining what was being done, making their work known more widely, um, put it to good use. Uh, and again in America, uh, under Roosevelt's New Deal, uh, a lot of money went into filmmaking, including the two famous Perry Lawrence films, uh, The River and The Plough That Broke the Plains. Uh, and those two uh, both had scores by Virgil Thompson, which, uh, as we shall be seeing with Nightmail, uh, it can be a case that the score outlives the purpose for which it was originally composed. Uh, then, on the outbreak of war in Britain, the various government film units were gathered together uh, as a central government uh, organisation called the Crown Film Unit, uh, and it was for the Crown Film Unit uh, that Diary for Timothy was made, uh, though Nightmail was, was, was uh, the, the GPO unit. So, uh, that is a background to how some 
very good films got made amongst a lot of uh, rather more routine ones.